y'all uh, y'all would let's stand in honor the reading of the Word of God. Romans chapter twelve. Bibles like mine be on page thirteen fifty six. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, good, and just because something sounds good doesn't mean that it's biblically accurate. There's, there's sayings that are out there. I mean, some of these things I'm guilty of saying. Some of these, some of these things, the, and when I say I'm guilty of it, I've, I've sat and I've heard it over and over and over um, since I was a little boy, these things. And, and you start thinking that these are things that are in the Bible when come to find out when you read the Bible, they're not in there. And I'm talking very particularly about a couple of sayings today. One of them is... Uh, the infamous, have you asked Jesus into your heart? That is not in Scripture anywhere. Now, the concept may be there, but the saying is not. Have you asked Jesus into your life would be the other one. Now, those statements are normally used with the best of intentions. I, I really don't think I've ever known a person to use them that had a bad intention using them. But let's, let's look and see what is actually biblically accurate that way, when we do say something, we don't cause confusion, especially for a new believer. Now, you need to understand something about Jesus being in your life. He's in your life whether you want Him in your life or not. Jesus is involved in every person's life. And I think the, the third thing that I hear people say is you, it's all about having a relationship with Jesus. Well... Everybody, regardless of their standing in Christ, has a relationship. And it may not be a good relationship, but they have a relationship. I want you to think about it. Judas Iscariot, he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus was in his life. Satan had a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was in his life and still in his life. Jesus was in the life of the Pharisees that crucified Him. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the creator of all things. He's the source of temporal life, and He's the source of eternal life. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, well preacher, that's why I need to, need to ask Him into my heart, because He's the source of those things. When people talk about inviting Jesus into your heart, the verse they point you to is Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Notice something though that the word heart's not mentioned here. This verse is pretty literal of Jesus knocking on a on a real door here. That uh, when you get spiritualized, always oh, knocking on the door of your heart. Well, that's not the case here. The word heart's not even not even here. Let's look. Let's go and let's look at Romans chapter twelve, and we're gonna we're gonna start talking about uh, some of these things just shortly here. Romans twelve verses one through two. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, we're reminded here in verse 1 that Paul's talking to saved folks. He's talking to saved folks in Rome in particular. He, Paul's been preaching a while. He's talking to people. He even, he even uses the word brethren when he's talking with them. 
He's telling the believer to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now the key word for that is living. Something that's doing something, something that's moving. Not something that's just sitting there stagnant. When a sacrifice is made on an altar, that sacrifice is alive. I, now, I want you to get that picture because sacrifice is, a, is a, a disturbing thing when you really start thinking about it. When they would sacrifice these animals on the altar, it wasn't that the animal was killed and put on the altar. The animal was put on the altar and then killed. The animal was put on the altar and, and bled. The animal was put on, on the altar and burned. This is a gruesome thing that we're talking about, but it's a living sacrifice. Now, Jesus was able to pay for our sins because He was alive to pay for them. What good would it have done for Jesus to, for His dead body to have been whipped? You, you do realize that, that when a person succumbs to execution, they stop whipping them, right? It's over. It's done. They're not paying for anything else. What good would that have done if they would have hung his dead body on the cross? If they would have killed him first and then put him up there? The answer is none. This is the same reason that a man who is dead in his sin cannot do anything to please God. He's already dead. You can pray... You can tithe, you can feed the hungry, you can house the homeless, you can do whatever kind of good deed that you want to do. You can even preach. But if you are not fully trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are lost and on your way to a devil's hell, no matter if he's in your life or not. Think about those whose life he was in. When a person believes on Jesus Christ and trusts Him, trusts him with their soul, that person receives eternal life. 1 John 5.13, the Word of God says this, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. The born-again believer possesses eternal life, and they, they're now... When they're born again, when they're, when they're quickened, when that spirit's quickened, when they're, when they're given new life, now they're able to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. We don't ask Jesus into our heart and we don't ask Jesus into our life. Instead, we trust Him with our soul. We give Him our hearts. We give Him our lives. They become His. Jesus gave us everything. And in return, we owe Him everything. We ought to strive to be holy because He's holy and we're His. This is a reasonable request for us to comply with. Everything we have is a gift from God and we ought to treat everything that we have as it's a gift from God. Your job, your house, your finances, your family, every bit of it is a gift from the Lord. And the purpose of everything you have as a born-again believer is to be in the service of God. It's all His anyway. Every, every bit of it. You say, well, I work for mine. You did? I bet you used air that He gave you. Oh, I put, I put, in, the, I put in the time. I got the education. You did? I bet you used the mind that He gave you. Oh, I saved money. You talking about that money that says, in God we trust? Yeah. That's on loan from Him. Every bit of it on loan from Him. Now let's look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Christians should not be conforming to the world, and neither should the local church. But I'm going to tell you what happens more often than not. More often than not, you have Christians that have more in common with the world around them than they do with their Lord and Savior. You have churches, more, more common than not, that have more to do with the world around them than they do of believing this book right here. You have churches right now in this community, in the abroad, every, everywhere you can think of, 
churches do different things. They, one of the things that they, that they do and, and is being promoted to do is, um, it, you know, you send out questionnaires to your community. And they'll, they'll help you with this. They'll, they'll, you, can get, you can get help from other organizations that, uh, that supposedly, you know, want to help the churches, the, the different associations and things like that. They'll, they'll help you send out these questionnaires to do demographics. You know, people will do a demographic before they uh, uh, check out the demographic of an area before they plan a church. Well, you, you know, you got to make sure that, church, that area is white enough or black enough or brown enough. You know, you got you to get your demographic right, huh? Then, but then they'll send out that that flyer and they'll say, "Well, what what do you guys want in the community? Oh, they want, want a coffee shop, man. We we'd love a place to go drink a cup of coffee. That'd be that'd be great. We want the church to look like a nightclub. That'd be that'd be all right. We want to have we want to have more music, more more concerts. So let's get some. Uh, you, you, some places, uh, hey man, we want some we want some of that bluegrass gospel music. That's what that's what they want there. Some places want some of the 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 smoke and the mirrors, and and they literally send out flyers. Some of you may have gotten them in the mail." Living out, living out rural like we do, you don't get as much of that uh, as because typically uh, the churches in the rural areas are, are a little more. Uh, you you get what you get, and you don't complain. It's kind of like kind of like eating at uh, eating at home. You, know, you get what's put on your plate, and you don't have a say in it. But as you get start getting closer into the cities, man, everything matters. Every every detail. Now in the local church, man, you people argue over uh, stuff that's a whole lot of. A whole lot less important than uh, than than just about anything. I've seen churches argue over the color of the carpet, the who sets that, the the temperature of the room, what company they use to to replace air conditioners with. I mean, just every in the rural church, everything's a good old boy system most of the time. Now, uh, and the and, but they they still, you know, you got this element of give the people what they want. Every everything they want, and I want to tell you what the what the world wants. Y'all see what the United Methodists wanted? Hmm. Y'all should have uh, should have looked at that. Uh, the United Methodists decided it was a good idea to remove any verbiage um, about about what we call alphabet soup. Um, remove any verbiage about about the um, anything to do that's contrary to to a, a marriage being one man and one woman. They removed anything about that from from their doctrine that they're teaching there. They removed anything that would Im- imply that anything other than a man and woman being together, anything that to imply it was uh, was sin, they're not going to preach it anymore. Let me tell you what the world wants. The world wants women preachers, short emotional sermons. They want to name it and claim it. They want to be able to sin with zero accountability. They want to be able to look spiritual while they're out there praying in tongues. They want to tell you what God told them in a private conversation. Just uh, just yesterday, uh, I heard a woman tell tell a, a fellow that uh, the reason he didn't know uh, what she knew was because God had revealed it to her. But it, she, God had somehow decided to reveal things that were contrary to Scripture, so I, I got a kick out of uh, I got a kick out of hearing that be said there. But I want to tell you something about the early Christians. Early Christians refused to conform to the world, and there's still a remnant today who still will not conform. Early Christians were arrested, tortured, and murdered murdered for the the crime of being haters of the human race. Now you think about that. That's what the early Christians were accused of, of being haters of the human race. All because they would not conform. Early Christians were ironically called atheists by the Catholic Church because they would not bow down to their false idols and worship. Early Christians knew what it was like to be in God's will and in the world and especially the religious world's crosshairs. The thing about early Christians, though, is they didn't keep their mouths shut about it. They stood for the truth of the gospel, and they didn't back down from the truth. Nearly every person who has ever been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ chose to be martyred when they could have chose to conform. They didn't conform because they counted everything that this world has to offer as dung 
when it's compared to the things that God offers. Romans 12, verses 3 through 8. For I say though the grace given unto me, excuse me, for I say through the grace given unto me that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So Paul lists seven different gifts for us here. First one's prophecy. Now, hear what I'm saying here. A, you, want, you want some gifts? Here, let me, let, me, let me show you about these things here. A Christian who has read God's Word and believes God's Word ought to be able to speak of events in God's Word with authority. Even events that haven't taken place yet. We ought to be able to proclaim those events as history that has not happened yet. We ought to be able to speak with, with all the assurance that the prophets in the Old Testament spoke with because we've read it in God's Word. We've got it directly from the source. We ought to be able to... We ought to all be prophets to the, the world, especially, because we, we know what's going to happen. We've all, to a degree, that believe the book, we all have that gift of prophecy if we choose to use it. Ministry is the second gift. And what the word ministry means, you know, people like to, um, people like to throw the word minister, minister as, a, uh, as a title. Um, and it can be. Uh, it definitely can be. But in Scripture, ministry or being a minister has nothing to do with an with a, uh, elevated position. This is a low position. This is a position of a servant. That's what that word minister means. It means, to, it means servant. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have several people, even people just in this room right now, that are servants that have the gift of ministry. Now, many people are, are quick to ask the question from time to time, how can I help? What can I do? When you're asking that question... When there's a situation going on and, and you're asking, hey, how can I help? What can I do? Can I, can I do anything for you? Can I, can I prepare a meal? Can I do? That is a gift of ministry that is actively uh, being put on display just with you asking a question. Now, the problem is you've got a lot of people that will ask that question hoping that they say, oh, nothing, never mind, no, we got it. Don't. Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me give you some, uh, some advice here. Don't, I, don't just ask, hey, what can I do? Let's use, let's use the example of uh, someone lost a loved one. Don't go in there and say, hey, um, what can I do? Well, you just walked in the door. They got a sink full of dirty dishes. Go wash them. All right? Go do something for them. I, some, something I've seen my dad do so many times. If somebody in the community passed away down there, you could just about guarantee that his lawnmower was going to go cut their grass because he knew people were about to come visit them at the house and that's the last thing in the world that they're thinking about is, is what their grass looks like. So he goes out and he cuts it for them. You know, because you know, he, my, my daddy, he knows that there's some judgmental people out there that'll come up with, hey, and grass is high. You know, that's, that's probably why they, why they kicked the bucket. They didn't want to have to cut the grass. I mean, he knows that there's people that do stuff like that. So he goes up there and he, and he starts, uh, he starts uh, without asking permission, he just starts doing. Now, Daddy, Daddy's not exactly uh, what you call church folk either. He doesn't, uh, he's not in church every, every Sunday, but he's still able to be a, a servant from time to time. You let your lawnmower tear up. You let your, uh, you, you let your truck tear up. That joker's going to help you work on it. He's not going to charge you anything either. He, he, like, he likes to help people. Christians can learn a lot from someone like that. Someone that when they see something that needs to be done, they just do it. That, that's one thing that the church as a whole needs to get better at is, 
seeing something and doing it instead of waiting, on, waiting around on somebody else to do it. You know why we got so many government programs? Because the church failed to do a lot of things that the church was supposed to do. One of the next gifts that Paul talks about is the gift of teaching. Teaching is a gift that comes with a huge responsibility because if you're called to teach, first you're called to study and to learn. If you're not going to study and you're not going to learn, guess what? You ain't going to teach. And if you try to teach, you're going to mess it up. The, the next gift is exhortation. Now, this is a little different than preaching. This is, this is calling people in, expressing with a sense of urgency for someone to trust in Jesus. Now, some of the best teachers and preachers in the world are not very good at exhortation. Some even have other people do the, the exhortation for them. Some, you'll, go to, you'll see it in some churches where, man, that, that preacher, he can... Man, he can preach. He knows the word, but when it comes down to uh, to getting people to respond to the word, or even even just asking them the question uh, and and clo- close helping them close the deal and and really leading them to the Lord, there, a lot of your best communicators are some of the worst at doing that, and, and that's and that's fine. But a lot of times they surround themselves with people that are that are great at it. And a lot of times you'll see in the church where some of your worship leaders are some of the best at being at um, at the best at exhortation, the best at calling people in. There is a fine line with it, though. There's the fine line getting caught up in emotionalism, especially with your worship leaders. But some of those guys are just really good at what they do. Now it works both ways. Some of your best, uh, best exhorters are terrible preachers and terrible teachers. The gifts are different gifts. And it works out great when this person has, has both of these things, but sometimes it doesn't happen. One time and one time only since I've been a Christian have I ever felt the need to, uh, after somebody else had preached, to, to get up and aid with an altar call. <laughs> And I, I remember sitting there listening to this thing, and I'm thinking, my goodness, man, this is a good message. This was really good. And I could just see it on the eyes of these kids, man. They were, they were hooked on this thing. They, they, were, they were believing what was being, being preached. And then here he goes. He was just going to close it, close it out in prayer. I'm sitting there to myself. I'm like, all right, self, don't you do it. Don't you stand up. Then I... Self stood up. I, and I was telling myself, hey, don't you do this. So this had to be the Holy Spirit just taking over and making me do something. So I, I stood up and I started, uh, I, I presented the gospel there to, to a group of kids. And it was after one of, one of the better messages I'd ever heard this preacher, uh, preacher preach. And uh, I started presenting the gospel. And then we gave that, that invitation to, you know, to believe the gospel there. And them kids, man, they was like, I think eight of them that night. Uh, they, they believed the gospel for the first time. Now what was happening simultaneously um, with all this going on is the preacher had been preaching for a long time. Uh, he, he'd, been, he'd been talking for a, a, quite a while. And this was a youth event. There was a mama outside and she was going off fussing and carrying on. I didn't know about it because I was in there with the kids. But she was fussing about how the preacher was preaching way too long. There's no sense in this. There, this is ridiculous. Uh, we got a bedtime to keep, this, that, and the other. Well, one of her boys was one of them that was in there giving his, giving his life to Jesus. I'll, ne- I'll never forget that. You know, when that door opened, she had, she had been out there telling everybody, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I, I'm, I'm, this is ridiculous. I, I got, I'm going to go in there and shut it down. They've been in there too long. And then her boy comes out, gives mama a big hug, and tells her that he got saved. She didn't have nothing to say. That night, I look on Facebook, and she done poured her heart out. She was ashamed of herself for how she was feeling. She knew that Satan was using her um, to, or, or trying to use her to rob her own child of of believing the gospel. Now, she, she was extremely remorseful for that. I, I can just about imagine she's never complained about a long serv- service again. Um, but to know that, 
she was this close to walking in and grabbing her son out before he had a chance to believe that gospel. That's um, that's something right there, and and the fact that you know the Holy Ghost had to intervene in more than one way. The Holy Ghost had to keep her quiet out here, and the Holy Ghost had to had to uh, have a a good message brought through this one preacher, and then how the Holy Ghost had to had to make me do something that I really didn't want to do there at at the time, but it's just something that it had to be done. Now, I tell you this because I see it happen quite a bit in churches. It's happened here before, and I call the junk out when I see it happen here. Um, Whenever we have food in the back, do not get up before service to go tend to food. It will wait. Unless you're about to use the bathroom on yourself, don't get up. Don't walk out. You never know how maybe somebody right here is finally clicking with them Something they they're finally trusting the gospel, but you get up because you didn't want to pee before you came into to the service, and you walk out, and then when you walk out, their head follows you to the door, and their attention span's gone, and they forgot about what was being being preached. I want you to know, good and well, that when you're sitting there and your bladder's acting up, that very well could be Satan trying to interrupt something for somebody else. I'd rather you wet your pants than then prevent somebody from from believing the gospel. And if you'll take just a little bit of responsibility, you can uh, you can prevent that by by going to the bathroom before service. And you can take a little bit more uh, time if you've got to tend to food and realize nobody cares about what we eat back there because there's people that need to eat out here first. Food can wait. But now is the moment for salvation. The next gift is a gift of giving. Giving is a gift from God. And I'm going to tell you why it's a gift from God. is because everything you have is on loan from God anyway. Even your children. When it comes down to giving, the first thing that pops in your head might be tithing. Well, tithing is a form of giving for sure. And it's one you ought to do faithfully. But there's other types of giving. It could be that you're just scraping by that yourself with money. But you've got other things you can give. You've got time. You've got your talents. This passage, it tells us about giving and it tells us to do it with simplicity. If you are tithing, don't break out the calculator to get down to an exact 10%. It's okay to eyeball that thing. And it's okay, it's okay to round up too, by the way. I just want to let you know that. That's, that's okay. And if, y'all, if everybody rounds up, sooner or later I'll be able to afford that jet. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be sooner. What do you think, Ms. Robin? Well, are, we, are we close to jet money yet? Close to what? Jet money. Buy me one of them jets like Kenneth Copeland has. I, I think we're close to paper airplane money, but maybe not. A, I, can, I can fold my gospel tracks like a paper airplane and you know, we can, I can carry the gospel out in an airplane. I can do it. I don't figured it out now. Then there's the infamous question, though: Do I tithe before or after taxes, Miss Robin? What what do we do there? Before or after taxes? You're a tax expert. It should be before taxes because that's how much money you make. Well, there you go. We've we've heard it from from Miss Robin, tax expert. It's before taxes. But you know, I'm gonna tell you something. Uh, tithing was was around before taxes anyway, so I'm gonna go I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's before taxes. Then there's the do I give every week or do I give on the weeks that I get paid or do I give once a month or I can't tell you I can't tell you what to give or how much to give. I I can't do that and I wouldn't if you asked me to. Just keep it simple. You know what your situation is, pray about what to give and give what you can what you can comfortably give. Do it with simplicity and do it cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Please don't brag about how much you give either. Remember, God loves a cheerful giver, not a prideful giver. The next gift is ruling. The gift of ruling is one uh, that's got to be done with diligence. 
This means you have to stand fast. You've got to be able to get the job done. A good ruler rules to the benefit of those that he has the rule over. A good ruler has to remember that he's subject to Christ. The next gift is mercy. This is helping those that are afflicted. It's too easy to walk past them. Remember those, I was telling you that about the, the other gift where, where the, the gift of ministry and people would say, hey, what can I do? How can I help? But then they're really hoping, hey, I hope there's a, nothing that they actually say. That's because that person doesn't have the gift of mercy. When someone, when they ask that question and they, they're looking for something they can actually do, they, it's probably because they have both that gift of ministry and the gift of mercy. Now, I'm not saying you help everybody that's got their hand out. What I am saying is you show the love of Christ as often as you can and be a good steward in the process. There's sometimes you just can't, um, you just can't help certain things. And there's sometimes you might try to help something that you shouldn't have helped to begin with. And I, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to tell you all one where I helped where I shouldn't have helped. Not long ago, and this was, man, this is embarrassing now that I think about it. I, we had uh, Brother Paul Johnson visiting with us, and I took Paul out uh, to... Uh, we went and grabbed some lunch, and we took some gospel tracks from different places. And this this guy come up. We stopped at QT. This guy stops, and um, he he doesn't have his wallet on him. And if if y'all ever been in a QT, you you know you'll have the the cashier will be where I'm at, and then you're you got stuff on the counter here, and then they got you got stuff on the counter here, and they're ringing up two people at a time. So this guy's oh he's like I forgot my wallet, and we're sitting there witnessing to him. Paul's giving him a gospel track. Over, over here, and he says, oh, I forgot my wallet, and my brain says, hey, I don't want to break this opportunity. I don't, I don't want him to run to his truck because uh, Paul's, Paul's talking to him right now, and he's making headway. I said, oh, I got you, man. Don't worry about it. He said, oh, I can't have you do that. I said, oh, man, I got you, man. I'd, I'd love to do it. I reach up there, and, and uh, I said, I'm going to pay for it before you get back anyway, so I got you. He said, oh, man, I appreciate it. Well, I swiped my card, paid for it. Didn't matter to me what it, it it could have been every bit of money I had. The gospel was being presented right here, and I was going to let that happen. And then uh, I didn't think nothing about it. I thought to myself, "Man, I did a good thing." We're walking out the door, and, and Paul says, "You know, you just bought that guy's beer." And I said, uh, "Do what?" He said, "Yeah." That, he he said, "I he said I didn't know whether to stop you or what." He said, "You done said you was going to do it," and I'm like, "What in the world?" I said, yeah, stop me, Paul. <laughs> next, next time, stop. I mean, I, I was so embarrassed over that thing. I couldn't believe it. I didn't look over to see what it was. I'm just in there swiping my car. Here I am thinking I did a good thing. You know what would have been a good thing? If I'd have looked to see what I was buying. That would have been, that'd have been a, a, a really good thing. But it's got to be a, a decent story. These guys were trying to share me the gospel, and, and one of them reached over and bought my beer. That's a... Uh, that was embarrassing, man. I, I wanted to throw up after that because I'm like, I'm just, I'm just an idiot, man. Like, I, you, be, you better believe that nobody else on the planet is ever going to have me buy something for them that I don't know what it is. That, that ain't going to happen. And if Paul's watching this, I'm sure he's, got, he's getting a kick out of it because he laughed at me all the way home because he knew how embarrassed. How, I mean, it's not just he was just some random fella. This was a visiting preacher. That I did this in front of. I mean, this was this was probably my most embarrassing moment. So now you've heard it. So now you can uh, now you can you can think about that and say, well, yeah, I'm not as dumb as the preacher is. So you, <laughs> everybody can have that going for them. But then that gift of mercy it comes along with ministry. But everybody's got their hand out for something. And the guy that I bought this for, he didn't have his hand out. He probably felt just as bad about it as I did afterwards. I. I I hope he couldn't even drink it, but I hope he felt just guilty about it. Couldn't even drink no more. Um, but oh man, that was embarrassing. But let's look here at Hebrews thirteen two. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, six of these seven gifts are different from the gifts that Paul names in First Corinthians. First Corinthians twelve verses eight through ten. Here's what he names here. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, an, another the interpretation of tongues. Now, 
Isn't it funny, though, how the charismatics and the prosperity guys, they only want to focus on the gifts that draw attention to themselves? Now, I got to say that the buying the beer probably drew, <laughs> drew uh, attention to myself that was unnecessary. I hope God forgives me for that. I, I hope when I get up to heaven that they're not laughing at me. Hey, you remember that time? Yeah, I remember, man. I'm not, you know, nobody lets me forget it. But isn't it funny, though, how these gifts that are, that are showy, flashy, that's the ones that the, these charismatics and the prosperity guys, they, they want to focus on. Verses 9 through 16 are some really good um, instructions for us to follow. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceit. Now, some of these things are not exactly easy to do. And it's okay to struggle to do things that we're commanded to do. What's not okay is not to try. It's sin when you know to do good and don't do it. If you're blood-bought and born again, if you're a child of the King, then you ought to at least try to obey Him. That's a reasonable request. You know, there's that, that saying people always talk about, oh, the preacher's kids are the, are the worst kids out there. And let me, let me tell you something. I'm talking to my kids just for a second. There's, people say that. People, they, they say, oh yeah, those preacher kids are going to be the worst. Yeah, it's going to be said from now to the end of time. Here's the thing. You're going to be held to a higher standard than other kids. And the reason, they're looking at things that you do to see if they can find a discrepancy in your dad. They look at mom to see if they can find a discrepancy in me. And so... That's how. That's just how it it works. There, that trickles down. It, it happens with the with the pastor. It happens with the deacons. I I truly believe that the pastor kids are so bad because they hang out with the deacons kids. But you know nobody, nobody. Um, there's not been enough studies done on that one yet. But they they look for they look for a a reason. But now, as a child of a pastor, as a child of a king, the same way here, you ought to want to do better. You ought, to want, you ought to understand, hey, they're looking for fault, and I'm not going to give them any in my dad. Not through me. They're not going to find it that way, but they're looking. And so I want you to know that that is how my children will be attacked. Y'all need to know that. I, want, I wanted to make sure that that's clear for you. Something that I think about, though, and I think about it often when I'm faced with uh, adversity is, is I pray that I have the, the faith to act like a Christian is supposed to act. God forbid that something uh, bad is to happen to, to a, a, fam a family member of mine. or I pray when that happens, because it, it could happen, I pray that, that God will give me the help to act accordingly. I, can, I think the, about the worst thing that's happened to my family, um, like where someone got hurt was when Waylon got his finger smashed in the door. Remember that, Brittany? That was uh. I still that. You still remember that? I bet you do. That thing, his finger was smashed as flat as a as it was his thumb. It was um, smashed as flat as a nickel. Like that was rough. It's, and this door right here got him. And I remember, I remember when that happened. Brittany couldn't do anything. She, I mean, she couldn't breathe. She couldn't talk. She could barely walk. Um, and in that moment, everything had to be turned off in my brain to respond to, to what's going on. At that moment, I was going through some the most extreme part of the of back pain that I've ever dealt with. I had to turn that off. My back couldn't hurt anymore because now I've got to go tend to this child. And... I I grabbed him up. Brittany was trying to tend to him, but you know she was just hysterical. So I, I grabbed him up and I, I took him on out to the uh, took him on out to the car. I'm sitting in the in the because he had to go to the emergency room. I'm sitting in the the uh, passenger seat, and 
I'm just wondering, why ain't we at the emergency room yet? I look over, I don't have anybody to drive me. There's nobody in the car because Brittany's still acting hysterical. And uh, so she, she, come, she comes, she gets in the car, and she's, she's like, hey. And so I, I did the only thing that, that I, anybody could do. I said, shut up, drive, <laughs> and just go now. <laughs> like, calm down, we ain't got time for that. And she's like, okay. So she, I don't think she blinked all the way to the hospital. But we we get there and and you know your brain has to has to take over. That that's what happens there is you know training takes over and you start doing what you know to do without thinking about it. We need to stay in this book. We need to train our brain to be in this book. Train our brain to depend on God. Don't look in Scripture to see yourself. Look in Scripture to see God. Train your brain because there's going to be things that happen and you're going to say, well, God, I can't see you. You need to train your brain to see Him. You need to, you need to do that. When bad things happen, you need to allow your training to take over at that point. Um, and then you will act like a Christian in the right time. Now, I think about, um, I think about this thing and I'm, my, biggest, my biggest prayer is... I pray that as I come down to the, the end, whether it be of ministry or of my life, I pray that I'm able to, to finish well in the end, unlike a lot of folks that are out there. I think about guys like William Tyndall and how he went out. Before the Catholic Church had him, had him strangled and burned at the stake, William Tyndall's final prayer was for God to open the eyes of the King of England. And God answered that faithful prayer and King Henry the the uh, I, th I think it was the the eighth, but I've got seventh in my notes here. Maybe it was the seventh. Approved both the Matthew Bible and the Cloverdale Bible. The prayer was answered again when the King James um, when when King James authorized the production of the Holy Bible in the English language that we know and love today as the King James Bible. Even in times of trials and tribulations, we ought to strive to show the love of Christ. We ought to focus on finishing well. Because we, we need to, if we focus on finishing well, I'm going to tell you what we're going to wind up doing. We're going to wind up stacking up rewards in heaven to have things to lay at the feet of Jesus. Even if they hate us for it, even if people want to kill us for it, people, people like to say, well, what would Jesus do? Well, i tell you what He would do. Jesus would love and He would do it without compromising or conforming to the world. Romans 12 or 17 through 21 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, nearly every mention in this chapter, remember everything mentioned here, is a command for Christians to obey in order to live a life that's, that's pleasing to God. And I want you to understand this. If you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how good you keep the instructions. If you have not fully trusted Jesus, if you were to die or the church be raptured, then you will trespass for all eternity in hell. It's called a devil's hell because it's not meant for us to be there. And you will go if you're not exclusively depending on what Christ has done for salvation. If you're not trusting that death, burial, and resurrection, if you don't believe that that's enough, then you are on your way to a devil's hell. All you've got to do, and I pray that you'll do it before it's everlasting too late, is trust that simple gospel. Place your faith, hope, and trust and, and believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has died for your sins according to Scripture and that He was buried and that He rose again from the dead after three days according to Scripture. If you want to go to heaven, believe that. If you want to go to hell, believe anything else. The choice is yours, so choose wisely on this thing. Now, I want you to understand something. 
when you're believing on Jesus, I want you to remember, even the devils believe. It's not about a relationship. It's about trust. You've got to trust that what He's done is enough. You've got to literally believe that if what He's done isn't enough, then there's not enough that can be done. If you think you've got anything to add to it, whatever you think you're adding is the pride that separates you from God. Now, this is not... Now, we, we mentioned uh, um, earlier, you, you mentioned that, that phrase, easy believism today. You mentioned it. This is not, by any stretch of the imagination, easy believism. This is as hard of believism as it gets. Because you've got to get rid of everything. You've got to account everything for loss. You've got to account everything you've done as dung. And you've got to exclusively trust the Lord. Because if He can't do it, it can't be done. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name of all names, Lord. Lord, we just ask You today, Lord, if there be one under the sound of my voice, or maybe one that watches this recording later, Lord, that if they, they haven't trusted You, uh, exclusively for salvation, God. We pray that they would do that before it's everlasting too late, Lord. Lord, I pray that once they have trusted You, Lord, that they would seek that relationship, God, and, and to have a good relationship, Lord, and not one where they only where You only get uh, partial custody, Lord, but one where You got full custody of them, God. Lord, I pray that they, they, they visit You often in Your Word and in Your house of prayer, Lord. Lord, we thank You for all that You do. Most of all, we thank You for sending Your Son to die on the cross for our sins. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Y'all got business to do with the Lord. The altar is open.